Welcome to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by Compassionate Living. I'm your host, Hope Bohannock, and you can catch up on all our past shows and get more information by going to our website, hopefortheanimalspodcast.org, and you can find my contact information there as well. Today on the podcast, we are continuing the Humane Hoax theme, seems to be our theme for the month, because of Compassionate Living's upcoming Humane Hoax online conference. Uh, It's coming up on February 26th, so we're continuing that theme today with our guest, Emily Moran Barwick. She's from Bite Size Vegan. She created Bite Size Vegan, and Emily will be speaking at the upcoming conference, the Humane Hoax online conference at the end of this month. So I hope you will join us for that. We have five wonderful speakers covering numerous aspects of the Humane Hoax, the Humane Myth. So please join us, register for this free conference on February 26th, and I'll put a link to that registration in the show notes. But before we get into our conversation with Emily, I have some thoughts to share. So I've been beyond excited for all the beyond meat options in fast food, but there's been a recent controversy in the vegan community over the KFC Beyond Nuggets. And while most vegans are really celebrating all these advancements, there have been some who have been vocal about their opposition to this development, particularly with these nuggets at KFC. And I saw an image on social media that said something like, maybe KFC created Beyond Nuggets so that vegans would fight with each other and not with KFC. So uh, I feel like I want to address this. So the issue that these folks have, my understanding is that most of the KFC nuggets are deep fried in the same oil as the chicken flesh. I think there's some restaurants that have are able to have a separate deep fryer, but for most of them, the nuggets are boiled in the same oil. Also that they are unhealthy and KFC is just really a terrible business killing billions of chickens, so we shouldn't be supporting them or singing their praises. And if you're someone who feels this way, or you know someone who feels this way, I just want to say that, you know, I get it. I agree. I agree with you on all those issues. I don't know that I could eat them being fried in the same oil as the meat. That grosses me out. I get it. And yeah, KFC is a horrible company that is responsible for the deaths of billions of birds. But I also want to encourage these folks to think about a few things that I'm going to say about this. And here's my main message around this issue. It's not for you. It's not for vegans. It's, it's, it's not for us. As vegans, we can feel really left out of the mainstream. We want to be accepted and included, and I get that. So we feel like we should be able to participate in this, what really is a, a revolutionary moment. But for many vegans, we sometimes have health standards, purity issues that will take a while to be met, if ever. Uh, The focus of this should not be on us, not on vegans. The focus is on saving lives, immediately saving lives, animals' lives that are suffering. It's been estimated that Beyond an Impossible Meat saved a million animals' lives in 2021. A million lives. The health concerns, the purity issues, I get it, I do, I agree. But those can come later. I get not wanting to encourage people to eat unhealthy food, sure. But it is better. The nutritional profile is better than meat. And it's certainly better for the environment, and it's by far better for the animals. So again, I will say, it's not for you. Vegans have other options. Many of us can go to a vegan restaurant. We can go to the health food store. You can find healthier nuggets that aren't fried. But others may not have that option. KFC may be all they can afford, the only restaurant in their neighborhood. And not everyone's going to go out of their way 20 miles further to the vegan restaurant. Not everyone can. 
But if there's a better option for their kids, for their husband who just got diagnosed with heart disease, for the people who say, you know, I'll do it when it's easy, well, this is making it easy for them, affordable for them. So again, I say it's not for vegans. So KFC and other fast food chains that are offering vegan meats, they're doing what we asked. This could be the beginning of a huge change, changing them for the better, making their offerings more healthy and certainly more compassionate. Is it everything we want? No, but it's a process and it's a huge first step, a wonderful beginning with these Beyond Nuggets. It's not the end, final, perfect world we want, sure, but it's a huge start. You don't have to promote it if that doesn't feel right to you. That's fine. They have huge marketing budgets, fast food, so they don't need vegans to help promote it. But I would encourage you to please not speak out against it. The lives that can be saved are in the billions, and maybe someday the McDonald's sign will say billions and billions saved instead of billions and billions served. Okay, moving on to other things. So I have two announcements before we get into the interview today. The first is for all you Instagram lovers, I started an Instagram page for the podcast. So if you're on Instagram, please find us Hope for the Animals podcast and follow us, share episodes, share posts. Uh, let's, Let's get engaged on Instagram. And Compassionate Living also has an Instagram page. It's at reason for vegan for being the digit for reason, digit for, for vegan, reason for vegan. (laughs) So come play with us on Instagram. The other addition to this podcast that I created recently is a Patreon page. So now that I am venturing out on my own with my own organization, Compassionate Living, being the sponsor of this podcast, I'm going to need to find ways to support this work. And I am asking you, my awesome audience, to support this podcast with a monthly pledge to Patreon. And if you're not familiar with Patreon, it was created for artists and activists to be supported financially by patrons, hence the name Patreon by people who appreciate what what they what they're creating and if you appreciate this podcast I hope that you will go and sign up for a monthly pledge now some things about this so for many podcasts they have bonus content that they offer to people who pledge money I I, I don't I don't feel comfortable with that I don't like that Being a low-income person for many years, most of my adult life, the last 20 years, certainly since I've been in nonprofit work, I haven't ever had the extra money to offer monthly donations. And I mean, I've, I've lived much of the last 20 years having to hold off buying groceries till the next paycheck. So I always felt left out when I couldn't afford that bonus content or that extra special whatever it was, uh, some secret internal meeting and, and content and podcasts with the people that were giving money. And I, I just, I don't like that. I always, I always felt left out when I encountered that. And I want everyone, no matter their income level, to hear all my content, to be able to have the benefit of all my podcast has to offer. So I am not going to have bonus content as a benefit on Patreon. Even though a lot of podcasts do that, I'm not going to do that. It just doesn't feel right to me. Now, I am okay with merchandise. You would buy a t-shirt or you'd buy a book, right? So I'm good with giving stuff away. So for one of the levels on Patreon, I will be giving away my book, a copy of my book, and eventually I want to have more merchandise. But I have pretty high standards with that. I would only want, for instance, t-shirts that are organic cotton or bamboo or U.S. made or something like that. So it's going to take me some time to get the merchandise together because of ecological reasons. I'm just not, I'm not going to just go with anything. 
But if you sign up for one of the levels now, I will give you the bonus gifty stuff when I have it. So you would get it eventually, and I hope to have it sometime this year. So I really hope that you might consider pledging your support on our Patreon page, and I'll put a link to that in the show notes. Another thing that I would like to ask you, my wonderful listeners, is it's been suggested to me to start a gathering with you, like a Zoom meeting once a month where we can come together as a community and discuss the stuff that comes up on this podcast, like discuss it further. Other podcasts do this. Uh, You'd be able to ask me questions, give me your take on the issue, just further the conversation so we can get to know each other. Would that be of interest to anyone out there? If enough of you are interested in this, I would love to do it, but only if there are enough of you that want to do it. So if you'd like for me to start a group like this, uh, I, I would likely do it on the weekend during the day, like late morning or afternoon on a weekend day. So please email me and let me know if you're interested in that, if you're interested in a gathering where we further the conversation. My email is hope at compassionate-living.org and you can also find my email on the podcast website as well as Compassionate Living's website which is compassionate-living.org as well. Okay, so I hope to see you on Instagram or Patreon. Please engage and share and support this podcast on these new platforms. Get us going and uh, I hope to see you there. Okay, let's now move on to our conversation for the day. All right, so I am very excited to bring in our guest today. Today we have Emily Moran Barwick. She is an animal liberation activist, educator, writer, artist, and international speaker. And after completing her Master's of Fine Arts, Emily founded Bite Size Vegan, where she provides free educational videos and essays and writings and e-courses and resources all on all aspects of veganism. It's uh, mostly to help people go vegan and equipping existing vegans with the tools they need to get active. Communication has never come easily for Emily. She is autistic, but she credits her autism for her deep and empathic connection with non-human animals and believes that by seeing the world differently, she's better able to help others begin to think differently. So welcome to the podcast, Emily. Thank you so much for having me. Yes, it's wonderful to have you and all the way from Iowa. I know you are in Iowa, which is unusual. I think you're probably the first person I've interviewed for the podcast that's been in Iowa. So I'd love you to tell us a little about you. Um, Why did you go vegan? When did you go vegan? Why are you in Iowa? If you want to tell us, (laughs) Um, yeah, yeah, whatever you'd like to, to tell us to introduce you. I mean, I... Of course, I get asked all the time, like when I went vegan and I don't have a hard date. It seemed to be, I mean, as I think it is with all children, that we kind of have to be taught to eat animals. It's almost like this inherent thing within us that we have to kind of almost be, uh, you know, tricked into with why certain animals are okay to eat and others we like and, you know, you love finding Nemo and then you go eat fish sticks. Yeah. But apparently I wasn't having it. My mom says, I don't remember this, but she says I uh, started just refusing to eat meat about as soon as she started to try to feed me meat. If I could tell that something had come from an animal, I would not eat it. <gasps> so if she could disguise it enough, then I would. Wow. Um, so it was pretty like in there, I guess, from the Mm. beginning. But I did eat animal products for parts of my life. And I think the dairy and eggs aspect came later with me kind of learning more about like those industries and everything. But I don't have some time where it was like, oh, now this is a hard and fast thing. But as you mentioned in the intro, you know, I, I didn't know as a child, but learned, you know, in my 30s that I'm autistic. And for me, it really made a lot of sense that I had 
this kind of, so for me, like communicating is really difficult, even without knowing I was autistic, there was this inherent thing where it made sense to me that just because a being, whether they are human or not, can't communicate in a way that I can understand doesn't mean that they're not thinking and feeling and having all of these experiences because I was very aware that I was having thinking and feeling and having a lot of experiences that I couldn't ad- accurately or adequately communicate to others. But that didn't mean that I wasn't going through that. And so there's just never any question to me that other living sentient beings weren't having internal lives that maybe weren't readily accessible to me or other humans. You know, I didn't know that at the time, but it just was never a question to me. And I I know that you said that, you know, being in Iowa, you're kind of in the heart of animal agriculture. Uh, So do you want to talk a little about that, about being in Iowa and what that's like having uh, animal agriculture be such a part of the community and the society? Yeah. So yeah, Iowa is really kind of at the heart of America's agriculture and the heart of America. We're kind of right in the, in the middle there. Mm. And Iowa um, has more pigs than any other state as far as, you know, like in confinements and, and farms. We also are the birthplace of ag gag regulations and laws. And a lot of that kind of, you know, very strong agricultural lobbying um, against transparency has been kind of birthed out of Iowa. But I've always found that it's important to kind of be in the midst of what it is that I'm trying to educate about. I have a speech called a wake up call for vegans in which I kind of warn a bit about how when we go vegan, sometimes we can almost become overly insulated within our nice little vegan world bubbles. And to a certain degree, we need that safety because it is too much to think about and know about all the time. But at the same time, you know, remaining aware of what's going out there. And also the fact that living in a place like this, my interactions are almost exclusively with non-vegans. And that gives me opportunity to have different discussions and interactions. Whereas if I'm surrounded by vegans all the time, we already know to be vegan, you know, we're doing it. (laughs) So I I find it, I don't know, I find it important to kind of work from the epicenter of it. You know, and I don't go around, it's not like in my daily life, I'm out just yelling at people about (laughs) veganism. It's just, there are these just opportunities. Well, actually, I can tell you the one story I'd, I'd started before that. Yeah, I was, I had flown back from a speech I had had delivered somewhere. I can't remember where I was speaking, but I'd flown back to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, and I was in an Uber on my way back home. And we passed by a livestock trailer with pigs. And I had just mentioned something about how sad it is to see them and everything. And the driver asked me some, had asked me about some questions about like where I'd been or what I was doing. And somehow we got around to the point where I was talking about how pigs are killed in these gas chambers and how brutal and terrifying it is for them, but how that is seen as this humane method, even though it's, it's absolutely not. And so I was talking about how they're on their way to this gas chamber and he was baffled by this and he'd even grown up around farms and had no clue that this is the way that pigs are killed around the world or in these barbaric gas chambers where they essentially burn from the inside out, it starts to create this chemical acidic reaction. Mm. And he was, it it just kind of blew his mind. And, you know, I, and I never, we just had a, a, an interesting discussion about it. And it wasn't until, I don't even know how long later, but I was doing a hangout with patrons, like, you know, on my, on my Patreon, like I do a a hangout once a month where anyone wants to just be on the video and chat. And I see a a man who I haven't seen on the call before and he's like, oh, I was your Uber driver. And so here he is, you know, like after this encounter that we had and now suddenly here he is, you know, and it was amazing that like that little conversation I had, I guess, made enough of an impact on him that he wanted to look into things further. And it just really touched me. Because I wasn't, there was nothing in that discussion that I was saying, oh, you're wrong or whatever. And that's the kind of thing that I try to, when people talk about how do I be an activist or how do I, you know, I feel like we have this thought that we have to be out there like 
pounding the pavement or whatever. And it's like, really, there's so many opportunities just mm-hmm. in daily life where, yeah. and it, and, and it doesn't have to be this confrontative thing there, there. I mean, there's a time and place for that for sure. But anyways, just those kind of interactions that I've had so many times in Iowa where it's not necessarily that people out here or anywhere are, you know, oh, you know, farming is always good or anything. Like even if they're in the heart of it, a lot of times they just aren't really aware of mm-hmm. what's going on yeah. as much as everyone else isn't aware. Um, and so just even just sharing with people what's actually going on can be really powerful. And then giving them the time and space to follow up on that. It was very unexpected. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so so he didn't even know your name or your group or anything like that. I think I'm, I must have told him because obviously oh, okay. he, found, he found me yeah, later. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so he must have he must have asked me like, well, what I must have said something like bite sized vegan. And I guess oh, somehow he okay. found me. But it was just so wow. it was such this moment where he's like, yeah, I was your Uber driver for that one time. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, That's amazing. I love incredible. it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And it's true. You're absolutely right that, you know, we don't have to be out there protesting or what, I mean, and like you said, there's a place for that and it's, you know, we need all aspects, but, uh, but just daily conversations. I mean, that's when people, you know, are influenced is just by friends and colleagues and people that they see on the street, you know? So that's, that's really a great story. I love it. So Emily, you are going to be one of our presenters coming up in our Humane Hoax online conference on February 26th. And I invited you to be a speaker because of your powerful essay in the anthology Vegan Voices. And we did a Vegan Voices series on this podcast last year, featuring several of the authors in the Vegan Voices anthology. And you are one of those authors as well. And I really loved your essay. You talk about the humane hoax. It's called The Harm of Humane. And you also have a section on your website on Bite Size Vegan dedicated to the humane myth. So can you talk about what inspired you to write this essay? Yes. So I I personally, I I feel that the humane myth is perhaps the most destructive, dangerous, and like seductive barrier to people going veganism and effective activism. Yeah. And I, and I think that's namely because it, it appeals to all sides. So for like a vegan, vegan activist, or someone who's afraid of coming across militant or coming across as extreme, there's this temptation to provide less intimidating suggestions for people. So whether that's try meat free Mondays or do local free range eggs. And then for you know, for activists who are fighting for animal liberation, the humane myth offers this kind of concept of like, well, wouldn't, isn't it, isn't there some victory in giving them better conditions while we fight for the ultimate goal of their liberation? And then certainly, of course, the most appealing is for non-vegans because the humane myth essentially is the, the holy grail of humanity, which is getting to continue the behavior we want to do but letting us feel good about it. We all know something's wrong (laughs) because even if you get people who are, you know, like animal, you know, it's our right, you know, to eat animals or like, I love you, whatever. And then it's like, well, do you want to watch the slaughterhouse footage? Oh, no, 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 no. I don't want to, I don't want to see that. Yeah. So it's like, even we know there's like, you know, that dissonance there, Mm, but mm -hmm. this is kind of that, oh, I get to do what I want to do anyways, because changing is, is scary for all humans. But now I can feel okay about it. Now I don't have to have that kind of nagging sense of, you know, just disquiet. And so when it comes to the activist side of it, or, you know, or vegans talking about it, I think sometimes it's well-intentioned, like we're trying to bridge this gap and meet the public where they're at. And so there can be that temptation of like, well, they're not going to go as far as veganism or that, you know, so like, we've got to give them some steps, but then there becomes this risk of reducing, like, you know, the ethical imperative of veganism to this like lifestyle choice or a gradation kind of thing. Right. Uh, you know, but I'm extremely passionate about everyone's right to information, you know, and especially about information that impacts, you know, your health, 
the planet as a whole, our society, and especially the lives of sentient beings. And so my approach for activism has always been, it's not a matter of forcing or convincing. It's just giving people the actual information. Because I do believe that if most people, if they're given the actual truth of what's happening, what's being done in their name, what they are paying to have done to living creatures, that they wouldn't want to support that. Anyways, just getting into the humane myth, I think is so important for everybody involved from, you know, vegan activists to the not to non-vegans because it damages, it's damaging for everybody and it's dangerous. It's a very seductive kind of trap to keep everything the way it is or even make it worse. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And speaking of making it worse, I, I so often hear activists say, and, and just like you were just talking about, Things like, well, at least cage free is better, or you know, grass fed is better, or humane, any label. Mm-hmm. But in your article, you talk about the label cage free, and you cite a study that revealed that chickens in cage free system systems can have double the mortality rate, double the rate of chickens dying as a battery hen operation. Mm-hmm. And after you know extensive research that I did for my book, The Ultimate Betrayal, I came to the realization that some of these labels and some of these farming met- methods are even worse or can be even worse than common methods when we think just across the board that they're all at least a little better. Well, that's not necessarily the case. Uh, an example in the humane area is organic dairy and in the environmental impact is grass-fed beef actually can be worse. So I I wonder if you want to talk a little about this, about how it can actually be even worse than conventional. Yes. So the the study that I was talking about, I I speak about that um, in more depth in my speech that I gave in Dublin, Ireland. There is an activist and farmed animal sanctuary founder there, Sandra Higgins, who is incredible. And she has a, a phrase that I think really captures it where she says their bodies are their prisons. So she did this entire report on looking into the difference between battery caged and enriched caged chickens. And this kind of speaks also to these cage free chickens that because we still breed them to produce maximum egg output they are still made into these machines who then they get these fragile bones because they're losing so much nutrients because they're overproducing eggs they're so fragile because we've imprisoned them in their own bodies yeah. and it's the same for pigs we breed them to grow so fast that if you go to a farmed animal sanctuary they grow so big then they they can get health problems from being the size that they are. And so even if they've been liberated from their physical cage, they're still trapped in these prisons that we've bred into them. Mm. And, you know, if I'm not mistaken, when you're talking about organic dairy, the cows are going to get the same kind of infections from the constant milkings and the, and the, just the environment they're in, but then now they can't get medical certain medical treatments or certain antibiotics. And so we're still doing the problem. We've still, it's like, we're trying to somehow, we try so desperately to make what we're doing. Okay. And it just makes it even more absurd on a slightly different bit, but in, in the European union, and this is what Sandra Higgins was speaking to is that there was this ground, well, seen as this groundbreaking directive in 1999 that banned barren battery cages by 2012 of course you know so in 1999 by 2012 but in the media what you everybody hears in 1999 is like eu hens are cage free or like that's the kind of the impression everybody gets but really it was just replacing the barren cages with what with what's called enriched cages, meaning they're furnished and they would get essentially in the end, each hen would get less than a single playing card of additional space. And and then now also they have furniture to bump into and fracture their fragile bones. Yeah. And and Um, just to to clarify, because, because anytime we hear furnishing, I always envision like little couches and little (laughs) chairs and (laughs) 
all it really means is that there is uh, sometimes a, a bit of a, a, a perch to get up onto mm -hmm. and possibly a bit of a box, like a litter box to kind of get into, to do a little dust bathing. Uh, but it's, it's very minimal. It's still such a tight, tight, confined space. Absolutely. And then, and yeah. then they'll cram more birds in there. So it's the same situation. Right. Yeah. And, and the, the, the even more perverse aspect of this is that in 2012, 13 of the member states had failed to comply. So they had 12 years to give each chicken less than a single playing card of additional space. And 13 of the countries couldn't do it. Uh, but what people hear in the media is, oh my gosh, these hens have amazing welfare now. And so mm. then egg consumption actually increases. Yeah. And so that's another way that these kinds of myths hurt animals more is that because of the perception, the public now thinks now it's okay. And so then the demand for the products rises, yeah. but then the, the beings that this entire perverse charade is supposed to be for are still living in these horrible conditions. Uh, it kind of reminds me of like how, I mean, it just in general, if you look into all of this, it's like absurd how far we try to bend over backwards to keep eating animals. Like yeah. you just can't seem to yeah. let go of it. There's a project, Project Novo and other uh, projects where there's just so much governmental and uh, money and really bright research minds trying to go into ways of how to sex chicken eggs before they're hatched because the public doesn't like the whole grinding up of male chicks thing that happens in the egg industry. And so they're just trying to figure out how can we sex these eggs before they're hatched so we don't have to grind up all the baby boys. And it, it's just like untold amounts of money and time and research and everything instead of just being like, hey, you know what? Maybe we don't have to eat eggs. Right. You know, like <laughs> yeah. maybe, uh, maybe that's an option. Like it's just, yeah. it's so absurd. Yeah. Just how all this, like how much governmental time and energy and money and all of this goes into like putting together these regulations and all of this stuff to be like, maybe somehow we can make this okay. And yeah. it's like, yeah. you know, guys, we can just not do it right just not do it right that's an, that's an option you don't have to eat what comes out of a chicken it's yeah. okay <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely really well said and and it is frustrating when going back to the cage free and the enriched cages and all of that uh it, it, again all the time and effort, activist effort that goes into these things. I mean, there are advocacy organizations that focus almost entirely on the cage free thing. Mm. And it's just, ah, oh, it's so, it's frustrating to me because I get it. I get that they feel that this is gradation, that it's a step, it's a, it's, it's the, the way to get to animal liberation. But I, oh, I just, you know, in my heart, I question it. I'm like, well, what if we put all that effort into advocating for veganism? I mean, all that time and money and effort, uh, we don't know. We don't know if mm -hmm. perhaps that would be the better thing to do. It's, it's, well, it's, it's frustrating. Well, yeah, and there's um, Sandra Higgins also uh, is the, I don't know if she's a therapist or a psychiatrist or a psychologist, but she, she does therapy. And she's, she's said before how, you know, if I have, if I'm talking to a patient who is beating his wife or I'm talking to someone who is a self-harmer, my advice is never to try to only beat your wife on a Friday right. or to <laughs> cut, cut yourself just a little less. Yeah. She's like, that's never the goal. Right. You know, it's like, yeah, you, <laughs> these small improvements, like, what are we really doing? And it is frustrating seeing well-meaning activists right. uh, yeah. going for the, the, the welfare event. But there's there, I had been looking for this, the basis of um, the council regulation for the protection of animals, like this you know, big landmark stuff that happened after the Treaty of Lisbon. But I had I've been trying to find for the longest time this impact assessment because they kept talking about the impact assessment and how that was kind of the basis for why we're choosing X, Y, or Z methods. Because it talks up, they talk about the gassing of pigs in the, in the gas chambers. And it took me forever. I finally found it. And looking at the panel. Of, of the experts and everyone who's involved in the, in the impact assessment, you've got, of course, representatives from like, you know, the egg industry, the pork industry, the whatever industries you have like a token animal welfare organization or two. 
And then you have Butina and Butina is the company that makes the vast majority of CO2 chambers around the world Mm. to kill these pigs. So they're on the panel being like, that's determining what method we should use (sighs) for (sighs) this humane legislation. And it's like, when you look down into these things, it's like, none of this has anything to do with what's humane. It has to do with the dollar amount. It has to do with profit. It has to do with company interest. So of course the impact assessment was like, oh, you know, it's not really viable right now to find another thing. We're just going to keep doing this. And then when I dug even deeper, I found that at the time of the document, they were testing CO2 chambers for cows at the University of Iowa, where I went to graduate school. And that was a bit horrifying. (laughs) Oh, yeah. So at the end of your article, going back to your article in in Mm -hmm. Vegan Voices, you talk about the contradictory nature of these humane regulations and the humane hoax. And and I've always said that I really do believe that actually, even though we fight against this, even though we're so frustrated with it, this thing that we're going through with this humane labeling, I feel it's really going to be beneficial in the end. It's going to be in our, in the animal's best interest in the end, because we're basically admitting that animals suffer, that they are, uh, you know, that, that this is important. Basically we're admitting that animals have their own self-interest and that we shouldn't cause them suffering but farming inherently causes suffering. There's confinement and painful procedures and a terrifying death, no matter the label. These things cannot be avoided to make a profitable animal product. And in your article, you talk about this and you say, we can't have it both ways. And I, I really love that because it's, it's just so true. Do you want to talk about this, this contradiction uh, around these labels? Yes. Yeah, so kind of as you were saying humane regulations are an inherent admission of these animals ability to suffer and feel pain yeah and the whole welfare approach are is designed to spare animals what is deemed unnecessary suffering and so the unspoken implication being that there's some suffering is necessary when it comes to benefiting humans with the EU regulations that were put into place, it's kind of one of the most stark um, illustrations of how contradictory all of this is. So in 2007, the European Union historically declared non-human animals to be legally sentient. So they, in this, uh, the, the Treaty of Lisbon, I believe, And so they declared they're legally sentient. They deserve freedom from hunger, thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, disease, fear, distress, and mental suffering. And so you would think, oh my gosh, this is great. Landmark, like for the the countries are saying, are legally saying these animals are sentient and they can feel and they can suffer. However, having recognized their capacity to feel and have emotions and sensations like we do, They then off the back of that are like, all right, now we got to figure out how to kill them and it'd be okay. So that's how, that's (laughs) how the, the council regulation, um, which is like the protection of animals at the time of killing or something, the the absurd title of it. That's how that was born. This, this monumental legislation that had all of these ramifications and has the impact assessment and all of this came out of this declaration of them to be legally sentient and that's just like this a bizarre illustration of our relationship with animals that Mm. off the back of saying oh they're sentient they can feel our conclusion is then well then we got to be more careful about how we're torturing and killing them at least at least least on paper (laughs) and so and, and then of course like the the resulting council regulation that came out of this was viewed and is still viewed as this victory for animal rights and you i still see you know, activists, especially in the United States and countries where we might not have as, or we think we don't have as stringent regulations or something, pointing to that as this is the thing that we need to get to. But when you dig into it, it's just instead of all of these horrible things happening because we don't have regulations, it's that all of these things are happening because they're codified in the regulations to happen. But it's just this kind of very stark illustration of how we deem animals legally sentient 
deserving freedom from hunger, thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, disease, fear, distress, and mental suffering. Mm -hmm. And then we use that recognition to build this legislation that essentially in language that when you look at it is incredibly disturbing and borderline sociopathic to, to put together the exact manner in which we can legally violate, imprison, cut, burn, alter, and murder them. Mm -hmm. And and the thing is, though, is like when you get down into the documentation behind the legislation, it's not about suffering. It's not about what's most humane. It comes down almost always to the dollar and the cent. How expensive is it to gas the chicks? How expensive is it to grind up the chicks? How expensive is it to do this to the, you know, how expensive is it to cut the artery or how expensive is it to do this thing? And that's really where it comes from. So there can be all of this posturing as to, well, we got to do this for, you know, whatever reason, but it is good for there to be more recognition. It's just also important that we don't stop there. We don't with any of these things that we don't stop with reading the media headlines that, Oh, uh, battery cages have been banned. That's not the, that's not the truth. You know, you always have to kind of look further. Yeah. And it's it's not the, not the end of the story. It's like, it's like the whole thing gets reduced down to this one issue of the cage when there's so many other things going on, like you, like you're just talking about with their bodies and uh, you know, all different kinds of suffering going on. It's not necessarily just the size of their enclosure. Uh, Right. It's frustrating. Well, and just, one more thing on the, you know, the contradictory nature of humane regulations is that it also in some ways makes it, well, in a lot of ways, it makes it more egregious because we all know that knowing better, but doing wrong anyways is worse than doing wrong without knowing that you're doing wrong. But here we are saying these beings can feel, they can suffer, they have emotions, they have all of this, they deserve to be free from harm and whatever. And now we're going to design how we can torture and kill them Mm. it's it makes it more egregious than if you just weren't aware yeah Yeah. you know so yeah um. yeah absolutely well my hope though is that once this gets permeated into the the culture and the minds of people that these animals do suffer that they are sentient Mm -hmm. hopefully that is going to translate into eventual, uh, veganism, that the recognition that you cannot, uh, be humane and kill. Like you said, we can't have it both ways. Well, Emily, I feel like we could talk all day about the humane hoax. I love it. I love when, uh, someone else, uh, has the passion that I do about this issue, but I did want to ask you about your projects with Bite Size Vegan, your website, Bite Size Vegan. I know you have a lot going on there. Uh, you do e-courses, all kinds of things. And I, I'd love to hear about it. Tell us about your projects, what you're working on. So I started Bite Size Vegan because I found the reason I, I kind of went into it the way that I did, um, I chose to make Bite Size Vegan digitally based you know, utilizing social media um, as well in order to increase accessibility to solid information that's usually made inaccessible either through paywalls or educational requirements or just the sheer lack of time people have to conduct in-depth research. So I wanted to reach people where they are, which for better or worse is social media and, and digital media. So, because I find that a lot of, most people are, that's where they're getting their information, but generally the information you get there isn't necessarily quality. And then also, if you're just trying to look into veganism, it can be incredibly overwhelming. And I, and I find too, that for many individuals, the concept of veganism carries such a charge that can like spark defensiveness and resistance. And that's perpetuated by the, uh, just a multitude of incomplete or conflicting or confusing or just non-factual information. So I wanted to simplify veganism and bring together the accessibility of digital content and social media content with the integrity of research backed information. And I wanted kind of Bite Size Vegan to serve as an entry point for non-vegans to explore veganism in an approachable and non-threatening environment. It kind of also grew the second arm that I wasn't necessarily expecting of serving as a 
source of teaching tools for current vegan and activists. And, but it's evolved over time. I started with videos and as I learned more about technology, because I, I had no idea what I was doing, I started providing the full articles with citations and everything. So all of that is available on bitesidesvegan.org for every, everything I put out has a fully cited article. And then I, you know, started delivering speeches internationally. And most recently I've taken time to work on making the content and the resources far more accessible because while I'd already produced a significant body of content and resources before I did this massive overhaul of the website, it was kind of like if you go into a library and there's just a big pile of books in the middle of the room, like no matter how helpful some of those books might be, the information is only effective if you can find it. So a number of the projects I have been working on are, is essentially all to make it as easy as possible for anyone to find what they are looking for when it comes to veganism, whether they're non-vegan, whether they're an activist trying to, or, or a new vegan trying to talk to their family. And so some of the features that I created, one of them that I'm like the most excited about in like the most nerdy way possible um, is I created this thing called a guided search. And so, cause I found that when, when, when someone's looking into veganism, whether they are vegan curious or non-vegan or whatever, or they're struggling to answer families' questions, it can be really daunting to impossible to find resources specific to what, like, you know, might not know what search terms to even put into a search engine. So I wanted to create a, a search that would guide the user through a series of easy to answer questions to help them like assess their needs. And then at the end provides them with this custom curated content and resources. And I built this in, in bitesizevegan.org in you can find it in the guided search. My whole goal is to make veganism accessible. So another feature that I had put together is the e-courses. And I'm going to be going back through existing content, but also with new content put that I'm putting out and, and creating these e-courses. Um, because I, I've learned that what really makes things click for people is when they're given the space and the tools to process information on their own. If you give them that space to evaluate the sources and learn in a non-threatening environment, it can be integrated more than if you just kind of watch something and move on. So each lesson has a quiz. It's really low pressure because you can take them as many times as you want. You get feedback and stuff, but then you get a certificate. It's kind of fun. You know, I wanted to kind of provide a more uh, hands-on learning environment. That sounds so amazing. I mean, so much good, helpful information. Uh, well, and I'm going to be um, kind of coming back into producing new regular content at a different pace than I used to because I'm going to be continuing to work on all of these other resources with always the focus being on the accessibility of, of information, which I think is key. I'm essentially as passionate about the, the right to accessible right to know information as I am about being vegan. So that's kind yeah. of my my dual focus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I loved the idea that some of it is, um, you know, geared towards, uh, certain situations and certain people and different, uh, just different, uh, angles. Uh, I love that. That's great. Yeah. And like, oh, that's just one other thing I is like, now there is a way to, you can go to browse all content and there's a whole topics page too. But with that, I created all these different taxonomies where you can narrow things down by audience. So you can even look by like a topic, but geared towards non-vegans that's acceptable for kids and isn't an interview format. So you can get like wow. really granular. Very specific. It. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. That's so cool. Great. Well, everybody should check out Bite Size Vegan. I will put a link to that website in the show notes. Emily, we are going to need to wrap up. Unfortunately, I've really enjoyed our conversation and I like to ask my guests at the end, what gives you hope for the future? It's a really hard question because mm. I, by nature, I guess, I don't know if I'm really a pessimist as much as like, I like to think I'm a realist, but <laughs> you know, I do, I do always see kind of just the enormity of what we're up against. But mm. I think that I must have a kernel of hope because I keep, fighting. Yeah. And to me, it kind of comes down to what it always comes down to for me is even if 
I'm never going to see a vegan world. Or even if there's never going to be a vegan world, it's like, okay, well, what is my other option? Just do nothing. You know? (laughs) So for me, it's just, I'm going to keep trying no matter what, you know, I keep seeing, you know, more and more uh, mainstream companies offering, you know, vegan options and they're like in all of these like little ways. And then you hear different people's stories of change. And so I think there, there is hope out there, but even in the most pessimistic view to me, it's like, well, what is the alternative? Just not try. And so I feel like no matter what educating people is, is what is important. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And like you said, to be an activist, you have to have that kernel of hope, no matter what, Mm -hmm. you know. Uh, But I I could never uh, live with myself, feel good if I didn't do this work. So it needs to be done. We're creating the hope. uh, And we don't know, we don't know what the future holds. So yeah. Well, Emily, thank you so much for being on. I'm excited to get to hear you and talk to you again for our Humane Hoax online conference coming up. So uh, we will see you again soon. Thank you so much for being on, Emily. Sounds great. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. Thank you for listening to the Hope for the Animals podcast, sponsored by Compassionate Living. Just a reminder, you can hear more from Emily and other speakers as well at our upcoming Humane Hoax online conference that's coming up on Saturday, February 26th. I'll have a link to that conference info and the free registration in the show notes. And if you're hearing this podcast after that date, we are recording all the speakers. So you can watch the recordings on Compassionate Living's YouTube page or on the Humane Hoax website, which is Humane Hoax. Org. So I want to offer just a little bit of follow-up after my rant earlier in the podcast about the KFC nuggets and some vegan kind of internal conflict. And I listened to another podcast that I think talked about this really well, not specifically about the KFC issue, but kind of the broader issue of vegan internal fighting. And it was on the Food for Thought podcast with Colleen Patrick Grudeau. It was a recent episode. It was called We Are Not a Single Movement. And she explores conflict within the vegan community and why we tend to fight those that are closest to us, that are most in line with us. We as vegans, we as humans. It was really fascinating and I think kind of a nice follow-up segment to this issue that I was talking about earlier. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes if you want to check it out, the Food for Thought podcast website. It's a really fascinating uh, conversation that I'll have to pick up again sometime. Please help us to grow this podcast by leaving a rating or review on your listening app. I so appreciate that. Find us on our new Instagram page, Hope for the Animals Podcast on Instagram. And also just a reminder that I created a Patreon page as well. And I hope you might consider supporting the podcast with a monthly Patreon pledge through Patreon. I'll put that link in the show notes. Thank you for spending this time with me. I hope to see you at the conference later this month, and please live vegan.